back, everyone, to another episode of Rediscovering God. I'm here with my friend Dan Barwell again. Uh, Hi, gonna- glad to be here. Thanks. Good to have you here. And we're going to touch on another, you know, messy topic in the abuse series. Of- yeah. Uh, but first things first, before we get started, hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and give us both a big thumbs up if you like what we're doing here. Uh, so a very, very <laughs> messy term that everyone wants to avoid, oh, even yeah. if even if they're guilty of doing it, uh, is something called eisegesis. So for people who don't know what eisegesis is, I'm going to define it for you right now. It's an interpretation, especially of scripture, that expresses the interpreter's own ideas, bias, or the like, rather than the meaning of the text. So, yeah, as opposed to exegesis, where you're drawing right. out of the text its right. context, uh, its, its historicity, and uh, uh, what the writer in actually intended. Eisegesis reads into it uh, rather than draws out of it. Right, right, exactly. And then let's, uh, I'll define bias too, because bias is one of the biggest parts of eisegesis because with a oh, bias sure. you're reading your bias into the text so a bias is a tendency inclination or prejudice toward or against something or someone yeah some biases are positive and helpful like choosing to only eat foods that are considered healthy or staying away from someone who has knowingly caused harm but biases are often based on stereotypes rather than actual knowledge uh, of an individual or uh, circumstance uh, whether positive or negative, such uh, cognitive shortcuts can only result in prejudgment, um, prejudgments that lead to rash decisions uh, or discriminatory practices. And uh, let's face it, when it comes to eisegesis and uh, scripture, when when believing becomes a cop out for knowing you're in that eisegesis bias zone, when it's a cop out for knowing. And so often we've heard uh, and talked uh, a lot about uh, believing, 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 and uh, uh, knowing just takes it to a different level uh, because there's no room for bias. But uh, when biases are are stereotyped, they're often characterized as stereotypes about people or based on the group to which they belong and or based on an immutable physical characteristics they possess, such as their gender, ethnicity, or sexual orientation. This type of bias can be harm, have harmful real world outcomes people may or may not be aware that these hold they hold biases uh the phenomenon of implicit bias refers to societal input that escapes conscious detection and this is exactly what we see uh with christianity it's an implicit bias and it's slid right through without conscious uh, detection paying attention to helpful biases while uh keeping negative prejudicial and accidental biases in check it requires a delicate balance between self-protection and empathy for others. But what is bias? Uh, bias is a natural inclination for or against an idea, object, group, or individual. It is often learned and is highly dependent on variables like a person's socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, ethnicity educational background, etc. At the individual level, though, bias can negatively impact someone's personal and professional relationships At a societal level, it can lead to unfair persecution of a group such as the Holocaust and slavery uh, and many of the the things we've saw from Christianity over the last couple thousand years, uh, like the Inquisition and things like that. Starting at a young age, what causes people to be biased? Starting at a young age, people will discriminate between those who are like them, their in-group, and those who are not like them. Every week. (laughs) Their out-group. Every single week. On the plus side, they can gain a sense of identity and safety. And this is where people seem to get lulled in. And we've talked about how they get planted in the chairs and and locked down and then sucked in. They get that sense of identity and safety. However, when it's taken to the extreme, this categorization can foster an us versus them mentality and lead to harmful prejudice. And if you don't realize that um, the, the Christian gospels are absolutely biased, towards the Jews, though it's just all rife throughout the whole right. negative bias uh, on that the gospels. It's yeah, the Jews or the, the the scribes and the Pharisees are portrayed as 
as bumbling bumpkins right. written like a dime store uh, 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 novels uh, uh, villain and yeah. uh, read into it that way. But yeah, what and- is an unconscious or implicit bias? People are naturally biased. They like certain things and they dislike others, often without being fully conscious of their prejudice. Bias is acquired at a young age, often as a result of one's upbringing. This unconscious bias, though, becomes problematic when it causes an individual or a group to treat others poorly as a result of their gender, right. ethnicity, race, right. or other factors. Now, now, when we think about this, can a person be unbiased? Generally, no. Everyone has some degree of bias. Right. Right. It's human nature to assign judgment based on first impressions. Also, most people have a lifetime of conditioning by schools, religious institutions, their families of origin, and the media. However, by reflecting critically on the judgments and being aware of blind spots, individuals can avoid stereotyping and acting on harmful prejudice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, even this weekend when I was doing a few broadcasts, we had a couple of young trolls jump on... (laughs) Uh, on on a broadcast and start with some uh, anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, and of course, we have to just you know as soon as we're aware who's doing it, boom, they're rejected. But the point yeah, being, right. uh, you know, the, the, totally showing hatred towards the rabbis and uh, right. and yeah. Uh, but biases and cognitive errors. This is what goes on uh, uh, within Christianity. Right. Uh, a category of biases, also known as cognitive biases, which is what exegesis, eisegesis is considered a cognitive bias. It's right. your mental position. Yeah. Uh, they're repeated patterns of thinking that can lead to inaccurate or unreasonable conclusions. Cognitive biases may help people make quicker decisions, and that's the, the easy thing that, that mm-hmm. why people are drawn to them. But those decisions aren't always accurate. Some common reasons why include flawed memory. Uh, scarce attention, natural limits on the brain's ability to process information, emotional input, which we touched on with a lot of yeah. the Christian yep. uh, uh, fanaticism, <clears throat> social pressures, which is they, they push to death, and even aging. Uh, but when assessing research or even one's own thoughts and behaviors, it's important to be aware of cognitive biases and attempt to counter their effects whenever possible. Now, now this, when applied uh, to the idea of eisegesis, and uh, uh, scriptural tampering. I right. love Rabbi Singer's approach, uh, which if you haven't caught the flow of what Rabbi Singer uh, truly does, is he only reveals the factual, historical um, evolution of the Christian canon. Right. And uh, all you have to do is research the canonization of the Christian, what they call their New Testament, which we know is non-Testament because it's it's not valid. Uh, but when you look at what that entails, uh, you can see the tampering processes and the Christology evolving, as yeah. Rabbi Singer uh, so pleasantly puts it. But more than uh, the Christology evolving, the whole text was, and um, you know, a lot of. Uh, the oldest, uh, they, it wasn't even, the New Testament wasn't even canonized. I think there was uh, 50, 50 copies author, or, uh, 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 commissioned by Constantine to Eusebius uh, in around 339 BC. And of those 50 copies, a couple still remain. And uh, that is uh, Codex uh, Sinaiticus and mm-hmm. Codex Vaticanus. Those are considered yep. to be, yes, the oldest remaining comparisons. But what people don't realize is that these two alone have more, just in the Gospels alone, have more than 3,000 variations. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, Textual variations. There's over 3,000 textual variations between Sinaiticus and and Vaticanus, just in the Gospel alone, and more than 1,000 of those are in the Gospel of John. And uh, what what your pastor will never tell you is the book of Revelation is, uh, in the fourth century, wasn't even included. Right. Wasn't even it, included. It, it in didn't that. get included into the canon until the year 419, which was in the fifth century. Right. Almost AD. didn't even so make it, actually. It almost didn't. No. Uh, and there was a lot of other books that were considered canonized by some of right. the earlier uh, uh, ones. Like I know Rabbi Singer quotes Marcion uh, often, and Marcion, the Marcion, uh, uh, I think, was one of the earliest who had. Uh, uh, he only had the one gospel, a really yeah, the gospel of Luke, and gospel uh, of Luke, yeah. 
and then the undisputed letters of Paul. Ten, only had ten of the letters of yeah. Paul. And, uh, you know, uh, so you've got to see that this is the factual history uh, in from from the year it supposedly started until there's no uh, apostolic uh, uh, canonization of any sort. And so the ideas evolved Mm -hmm. and 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 Christology was voted on, um, you know, during the, the, the Council of Nicaea. Uh, yeah, and and this fanaticism gets it gets so the bias and the uh, eisegesis it gets so wrapped up and ramped up really that you get to the point where you now have, as he says, the the arrow in the tree with the target drawn around it. You where draw, yeah, you draw the yeah, shoot the arrow first and then paint the target later. Right, yeah. where they're so biased and willing to read their th- read their ideas into text that they're even picking scriptures in the hebrew bible and mistranslating them purposefully to match their narrative match their agenda right well let's let's face it that's a type of bias called anchoring bias and Mm -hmm. that's what we've been discussing a lot of the way uh anchoring bias is is uh, imprinted into people's minds if people follow the flow but uh there's other uh, types of biases like uh, actor observer bias uh when you are the actor you are most likely to see your actions as a result of the external and situational factors. Whereas when you are are observing other people, you are more likely to perceive their actions as based on internal factors like overall disposition. Uh, That's an observer bias, right? This can lead to magical thinking and a lack of self-awareness, but anchoring bias, people tend to jump at the first available piece of information and unconsciously use it to anchor their decision-making process even when the information is incorrect and right. or prejudiced, this can lead to skewed judgment and poor decision making, especially when they don't take the time to reason through their options. And when it comes to uh, true Torah Tanakh, uh, the Christian canon of their New Testament has absolutely no foundation that it claims to be hinged upon. Uh, but when they can convince you to have that anchoring bias, that's all you're going to see. But, you know, yeah. as B'nai Noach, we've learned to take off those uh, Christological glasses and look uh, clearly. And uh, when you have somebody, a great Hebrew scholar like Rabbi Singer or uh, Rabbi Michael Skobach sharing uh, the truth uh, from the Hebrew uh, scriptures uh, as it was intended in its historical context, yep. uh, what did the writer really intend and who are they talking about? And, you know, then it, the outlying passages aren't negated. They're mm-hmm. included. And that's what true exegesis does. Reads everything in context. Right, right, pulls right. out of, uh, of the text exactly what is said. Yep. And, uh, and there are know, so many types of context I think people don't even realize. You know, just understanding historical context is one thing. But there's prose or poetic, uh, musical, well, like I said, you know, I said all sorts of things that need to be taken into consideration before you can actually understand what type of text you're reading. Right, right. Whereas Christianity puts that emphasis on believing, and it's used as a cop-out uh, for knowing. And they actually right. start turning on you if you study too much. Uh, yeah, if you, exactly If you right. purport yourself as knowing more than you actually do, uh, mm-hmm. that's the way they start to treat you, as though you're part of the out-group. Um, and you know, they, they get all hands on deck and start pecking at you like a pack of wolves. And, uh, uh, if you don't believe me, uh, listen to some of Rabbi Singer's material, uh, uh, read his let's get biblical series and you'll start to see, okay. And then if you start sharing some of that stuff with your, your, your church friends, you'll find they turn on you like a rabid pack of wolves because you know, it's not the song they want to sing. And, uh, uh, but they have attribution bias. Uh, it occurs when someone tries to attribute reasons or motivations to the actions of others without concrete evidence to support such assumption. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's all kinds of biases. You can look at confirmation bias refers to the brain's tendency to search for and focus on information that supports what someone already believes while right. ignoring facts that go against those belief those beliefs despite their relevance and uh uh, all i can say is if you're listening to a trusted rabbi uh you're only going to get facts out of torah and tanakh and things in context 
with the true Torah and Tanakh as it's been passed down and trusted mm-hmm. and left unchanged. But right. if you research just the canonization of the Christian New Testament, you can see it wasn't until the 5th century when uh, the books that you have today and what you call your New Testament uh, were even canonized. Uh, and anything prior to 419 was totally different. And there was a lot of other books in consideration and argued. And more than that, you can go back to the early days. And I love how Rabbi Singer brings out the evolution of the Gospels. You know, if you look at them chronologically, starting with with Mark written first, yep. um, around mm-hmm. around 70 A.D., uh, and then you've got uh, uh, Matthew and, and Luke written around 80, 85, and then John, you know, 90, 95, 95 A.D., you have idea change and switch because you right. had, right? Uh, you had, yeah, you had the rise of the 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 the, the first Roman uh, pope, uh, pope, Pope Clement mm-hmm. of Rome, uh, and then you had to switch into a different uh, different agenda where you had the idea was starting to be forced into the matter rather than it be a original practice because. Uh, you can follow, uh, you know, the, the timeline for the next couple hundred years and uh, even the persecution in the groups that were uh, pushed by the wayside or, or excommunicated everybody along the way until they got the vote they wanted and the rule they wanted, which is no different. Now they've got uh, 10,000 popes or more in existence where every local church pastor yeah. acts like he's the pope over everybody okay. in his right. congregation and. You know, and many abuses happen. And uh, and you see that you see that anchor bias in every church you walk into when the way they tell you to read the Bible is starting with Matthew. And then once you're done the New Testament, then you can go back and read Genesis. That's that's anchor bias right there. When yep. you're anchoring your belief on the New Testament and then reading it into eisegetically into the Tanakh or the Old Testament, as they would call it. Well, what they fall into is is the curse of knowledge and hindsight bias. Uh, people with hindsight bias believe they should have anticipated certain outcomes, which might only be obvious now with the benefits of more knowledge and perspective, uh, which is if you question it within the Christian church, they will start to hammer at you hard trying to uh, show you what you should have anticipated and reinforce uh, their um, scriptural manipulation that has gone on in Tanakh. I, I love how Rabbi Singer often points out uh, the changes that they have made in the actual Tanakh. And uh, right. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I'm not going to dare comment, but there's loads of them the more you listen. Uh, yeah. I love how in one 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 uh, session he had mentioned that <laughs> all 216 so-called claims of Jesus in the Old Testament are completely nullified, and right. uh, let let alone uh, all Matthew's misquotes and uh, you know and Paul's distortion and skewing of the text. Um, all 216 so-called alleged claims of Jesus in in they just don't exist in the Hebrew context in the Hebrew in the Hebrew text and the Hebrew text with confirmation of uh, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, we've got a copy of the Isaiah Scroll that goes back to 300 plus BC, nearly 300 BC, uh, still sitting in in a museum in Jerusalem on public display, Mm -hmm. and it's unchanged uh, to today, and we can be thankful that the knowledge, the true knowledge, is out there, and this leads into what is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect, people lack the self-awareness to accurately assess their own skills. They often wind up overestimating their knowledge or ability. For example, it is not uncommon to think you're smarter, kinder, or better at managing others than the average person. And that's Hmm. what happens in the church services over and over and over and over. You listen to the pastor over and over and over. You think he's a very smart guy. But in reality, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect is taken over, and it plays on you and— You know, then you get into the fundamental attribution error. Uh, People are more likely to attribute someone else's actions to their personality rather than taking into account the situation they are facing. However, they rarely make this fundamental attribution error when analyzing their own behavior. And um, 
that leads to something called the halo effect is when your positive first impression of someone colors your overall perception of them. And this is uh, what you get with uh, you know, looking through the, the Jesus glasses is you've got total halo effect. Uh, it colors your overall perception. For example, if you are stuck by how beautiful someone is, you might assume they have other positive traits like being wise or smart or brave. A negative impression on the first hand can lead you to assume the worst about a person, resulting in the reverse halo or horns effect. Um, you know, and that leads to other negativity biases. And, uh, you know, it, you need to realize that biases are a part of humanity and you need to start to cope with them for what yep. they are. And eisegesis when it comes to the Bible is wrong, flat out wrong. It's right. Uh, even the Christian scholars uh, amongst themselves will tell you that it's not where they want to be, like you said, right from the beginning. They all uh, accuse each other of eisegesis, or they're not real Christians, you know. Mm -hmm. You're reading into whatever you, you see to, to, to develop your own your own thing. And, uh, uh, yeah, and it's still this, you know, let's browbeat and talk down and control others. And uh, that's exactly what the religion's designed to do and hold you there, keep you there. And if you're lost in biases, um, we see it all the time. Uh, new new people uh, open to no hide ideas, but they bring with them the baggage of biases and uh, their their Christian glasses. Still, they don't want to just throw them away or step on them. Uh, you, you know, it's it's tough enough to just take them off your eyes. Yeah, and start to see the true true truth of Torah and Tanakh. And let uh, 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 the the legitimate repentance before Hashem uh, begin to cleanse the soul, and uh, uh, let the true Torah wash uh, the soul. Mm -hmm. People don't right. want that. They 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 want they want their instant uh, uh, golden ticket out of the Willy Wonka bar. Uh, right. Always. And so see it for what it is. And uh, right. you know you cannot have stereotypes or biases. And and Right. Uh, I said Jesus is, 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 it's a problem for sure. It is a problem. And the, the anchor bias really does affect the decision-making process as, as we had said, for example, oh. like if, if you're, if you have this hammered over your head from the time you're a kid and that's the, that's the very first piece of information you're given, um, everything else then becomes subsidiary. You don't even believe you have options to work yourself through. And when options are presented in most cases, unless Obviously, there are the anomalies of the people who study and really yeah. have that. And, and, and I just want to reiterate, you know, the first road to, to, to study or and unchain and unshackle yourself from that, that type of slavery is to look at the formation of the Christian canon and just yeah. take the time. Uh, do yourself, if you're a student uh, of Scripture, if you honestly love Almighty God, just look at the history of the New Testament canon, and you will see there is massive development from the time uh, of its infancy. Like we know that the the, the confirmed books of Paul were written uh, in uh, you know from the late 40s into uh, up to the year 60. Um, but uh, after that, you had uh, the fall uh, of the temple, and um, then you got you know uh, the the Greco-Roman Empire uh, and, and, you know, whoever was doing the writing could basically write anything they wanted and there was no evidence to prove otherwise. And uh, just look at the, the history and the development of the right. churches and the ideology and, and just the formation of the canon alone, the arguments that went on uh, and they didn't agree on uh, what was their, their non-testament anyways. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you realize it took nearly 400 more years before the, that was even canonized and it was developed and fought over and argued over and hatred uh, spewed from community to community. I mean, that's not what godliness has anything to do with. Uh, right. You don't create a religion. It just shouldn't do it. And uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that's, that's what anyone in the early uh, uh, times, you know, intended at all. And, uh, mm -hmm. and in the English speaking world, you're still, 1200 years away from you know mm. what the majority of english speakers consider to be the you know their their inspired bible the king james version you know so well there was even much that's that had went multiple on revisions since different councils uh, you know just yeah just study 
the canonization process, people, and make your way out of uh, uh, that uh, abusive system that is only there to hold you there, keep you there, and have you pay and do uh, work for them. It's, a, right. it's an enslavement uh, uh, religion designed to uh, uh, own you, your family, and your mm-hmm. genealogy uh, in service to them. And uh, Almighty God has a true plan and a purpose for your life. And more than more than that, uh, he he'll help you achieve your full potential uh, in a setting that uh, in Christianity you're not going to get that opportunity, but you'll get a lot of promises uh, that never come to fruition. And um, if you just just even uh, cite the truth of their their hypocrisy when it comes to changing the text, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> like I said, even. Uh, Sinaiticus and uh, Vaticanus, uh, which are some of the oldest remaining texts, thousands and thousands of textual variants between the two that, you know, uh, realistically, uh, you know, paint uh, a totally different uh, uh, brush on development. There was, right. uh, you know, they were all redacted and, and, and altered uh, in order to get to what you have today. Uh, mm-hmm. But those are changes, 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 and a lot of those changes were done deliberately after uh, doctrines were were voted on and uh, made by papal authority as creed. And uh, mm-hmm. um, see it for what it is. It's a developed and that's like, that's, notion. That's got to be bias and eisegesis to the tallest order, because now you're not even reading something into the text. Now you're actually Changing presenting it, it make, that that's what the text says. You know, well, that's this is that painting, you know, shooting the arrow first and then painting right. the, the, the lines like you were talking about. And um, that's exactly what they did. And uh, this is why you don't hear uh, uh, of any uh, early Jewish uh, uh, actual recordings of the early matter, because it wasn't what some of these, you know, Hebrew rooters imagine. It's just mm-hmm. there is none. There is none. Right, they had a right. lot of. A lot of uh, maybe some Jews converted, and uh, but once Paul got it to a, a Greek-speaking world, you can tell there's a, a point there uh, in the 50s where it was no longer uh, a message to the general uh, Jewish folks. It's to the pagan world, which mm-hmm. had all kinds of pagan ideas. And like I've always said, you, you cannot negate the growth of the Manichaeans that happened uh, uh, once the Manichaeans took off in about the year 250 from the year 250 till 700 they were outpacing christianity hands down and a lot of the dualism that filtered into christianity uh came from uh manichaean dualism and philosophy and uh it was an over spiritualization uh uh anything you could bring up any point or topic they would give you some spiritualized tone and the the reality is that's using unequal weights and measures as far as language goes yeah and, uh, you know it's it's not uh it's not an, a, an honest tactic it's mm-hmm. uh you know anybody can call whatever the heck they want spiritual right. and um that's mm-hmm. what the manichaean success was especially in north africa they outpaced christianity they were hunted diocletian's edict still exist uh from 295 before Constantine, and uh, um, you just look at that Eastern dualism is where you get the, you know, the notion of uh, a second power or a dark power. Right, uh, right. Uh, Zoroastrianism. Sotin. Yeah, more or less. It came out of the East. He was a Persian that came. Uh, he was given, uh, uh, Manny was uh, given an audience in uh, the Babylonian, before the Babylonian king, or a king in Babylon, around the year 250 and uh he, the king of babylon was so uh, uh so amazed by his philosophy it, it took off right after that as an actual religion but yet you'll never hear about it from christian sources because you'll start to see where its dualism right, right, right. leaked into and not only was uh, christology written in but then their eschatology was written in as well and this is why you didn't have the book of revelation before the year the fifth the fifth century. I mean, uh, the ideas were still forming and even, even the questions were being raised. Well, what about, but what about, I mean, and it got so nutty and crazy that by, I think it was the seventh or eighth century. I mean, you had papal decrees right. that, uh, uh, banned 
banned the veneration of saints and angels, I think, mm-hmm. by the 8th century, because people were coming up with all kinds of nutty uh, psychiatric style ideas, uh, spiritualistic ideas. And uh, so the pap- papacy banned the veneration of angels. Uh, and then you're in the dark ages past that till the 1200s uh, mm-hmm. uh, or so, what they call the dark ages, because uh, humanity's mind was uh, just wasn't where it was. And, right, you know, right, you, right. you get a lot of. A lot of, you know, witch burnings and all kinds of stuff. But the mm-hmm. reality is, well, if you track a lot of that stuff, you'll see that a lot of these granaries were, uh, that they were, you know, living off of in small, older communities were, were, were covered in mold. And uh, they were getting hallucinogenic ideas from, uh, from uh, you know, eating tainted uh, grain in and, and, and their bread. And moldy bread was common, right. moldy cheese. I mean, you got to think about it. You're talking a, a world pre refrigeration uh you know there's a good reason why it was the dark ages i mean yeah you know yeah i mean the human mind just wasn't uh uh enlightened but it was highly right right superstitious and 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 paranoid right. and, you see uh, a big transition from you know greek well you start roman, to see some greek and roman come from philosophical from thought you know sure. where reason and know thyself you know like the, the ancient Greeks, while they were pagan, they they their philosophy was you know state of the art, obviously. And then advent of Christianity, and it all kind of just went to a standstill. Well, it was a, and now you're it in the was dark a steamroller of of absorbing all other religions and amalgamating them. It was their yep. melting pot philosophy. You know, I heard a wonderful message uh, the way the Jews d- developed their communities different. Uh, they they work with like a toss salad approach where the individual is synthesized with other individuals in a toss salad fashion right, right, right. rather than that melting pot or cookie cutter mentality where everybody's mm-hmm. got to be blended together like a soup um, and 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 your rough edges all got to be carved off and and uh, you have to fit in and uh, your individuality's denied and you have no room for gifts and uh, uh, right all about the greater cause of the whole rather than you and um christianity thrived in those in those environments right up until a great schism but then also around that time you started to have rashi uh start to come out with some great enlightenment and other great early hebrew works so uh, a thousand years ago the kuzari uh by rabbi uh, uh, judah halevi just beautiful beautiful work you know you had the, the uh the Khazars uh, converted to uh, Judaism when they were squeezed between the Muslims and the Christian, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and then so you had development uh, that, uh, you know, spawned a lot of enlightenment out of the Dark Ages and Mamanides, the Rambam and uh, Nakamides debate yeah, the Rambam. Um, with uh, in Spain, um, you know, and a lot of the fresh new ideas led to uh, a lot of what people imagine as enlightenment in uh, the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, uh, you know, things changed, but the Christian canon was still changing and changing and changing. And they had their arguments for why. Um, And uh, if you just research, um, you know, the biblical tampering uh, in the formation of the Christian canon, uh, you can see it plain and, uh, you know, I love how Rabbi Singer brought to light the reality that they didn't leave the books recorded in order, um, that Augustine was was knew that by putting Matthew in front of uh, and scrambling up the, 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 the Tanakh the way he did, you're left with going right from the prophets to Matthew. Matthew. And, uh, yep. That's the way the Christians think there's an answer to the problems that the prophets talked about, where they had the writings, the Hebrews, in their order of the Bible, they had the writings, and the writings were all the answers to the problems that were recorded in the earlier uh, prophets. And, Mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, Christianity tries to get the bias and the glasses on you fast, hard, and chain you down. And uh, if you understand where that in-group and uh, uh, out-group derogatory behavior comes into play. It's maladaptive, as I've always said. Right. It's a social psychological maladaption, and um, it's unholy. It's right. uh, it's 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 wolf-like pack and, mentality, and that's all they got. 
and uh, you can't tell them any different because they arr, 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 just start yeah. barking at you. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful to be delivered from such, um, you know, but hold to true, the truth of Almighty God as revealed in true Torah and Tanakh. Grab the hem of a garment of a, a, a wonderful rabbi and you'll find they'll put you on a true learning curve and you'll see legitimate change and legitimate right. development, legitimate growth. And uh, you can make the world a better place. But it begins by taking off those Christological glasses. It begins by uh, understanding the bias that comes by wearing those. And that is right in this topic of eisegesis. Are you reading into the text? You know, <laughs> and uh, re remember in all the years I sat in a lot of Bible uh, uh, studies and it was always pass around the room and what's this mean to you as if everybody's right. got their own interpretation. In other words, their moral relativism is what's caused the problem with moral relativism today. I mean, the world just, you know, fires back with uh, the moral relativism. They'd been stuffed, uh, been stuffed at the, the, for the last several thousand or hundred years from the church. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's interpretation, interpretation. It's all how you interpret. But this is, like I said, about, um, about uh, uh, you know, when believing is a cop out, for knowing, um, you know, you're copping out of knowledge is you got to see it for what it is, is your right. belief, a cop out uh, of knowledge. And all we're doing is trying to encourage you to overcome bias, take off the Christological glasses, uh, look at true Torah Tanakh for knowledge. And you can, you can begin by just studying the factual history of canonization of the Christian scriptures. And you'll see that it was a, a developed idea. And I think Rabbi Singer has been on a roll these last several years based on the facts of the historicity of Christian canonization. There's right. a development and an alteration and a, and a further refinement and development, even after the, the, the fifth century. I mean, uh, when you start to look at, um, you know, uh, what they call uh, the, the, the four great unsealed codes, uh, uh, you have the, the Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Alexandrinus, uh, and Codex Ephrami, uh, but those didn't come, like Codex Alexandrinus wasn't, was written somewhere between 400 and 440, and Codex uh, Ephrami, still in existence, wasn't written until 450, and, um, uh, fragments or, or pages, whole pages of these are still in existence, but you know, the, the earliest ones, uh, Vaticanus was def definitely written between 325 and 350 and mm -hmm. Sinaiticus between 330 and 360. And, and most, most, uh, scholars will, will, will agree that both Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were part of a, uh, a, a commissioned 50 Bibles ordered by Constantine from Eusebius. Uh, and Eusebius, uh, you know, did his best to fulfill them in a specific style. But this is all traceable history, folks. And when it's traceable history, uh, you can see its unfolding and the ideology and its impact and then for further revision and then its ideology and its impact mm -hmm. and then its further revision. And when bias is brought to the table, you it becomes political yeah. debate and argument and uh, who's in charge and um you know, this is all that goes on in churches. I hate to say it. And uh, yeah. And in regards to belief outweighing knowledge with some of these, some of these issues. Just cop out. Yeah. Belief I, is I've a even, cop out. I've knowing. even presented the, uh, presented the scholarly argument that the last 12 verses in Mark are a blatant interpolation. And I've received the rebuttal that, um, it's in enough, it's in enough, uh, manuscripts that even though it's not in the majority, that it should still be accepted because it's in some. I mean, that's that's just blatant disregard for, for um. Well, you know, I can send facts. you a link to to the differences. Like I said, uh, when it comes to the Gospels, uh, just between Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, there's over three thousand textual differences just between those. Uh, right. So uh, you imagine being uh, uh, commissioned by the the the, the Roman governor, uh, the Caesar. Uh, you know, commissioned to, to to get 50 Bibles. And back then they were handwritten, right? And so you had to get, you know, to get 50 of them written. And that was new in Old Testament. And of course, they all cite using 
the Septuagint for their Old Testament, but Mm -hmm. let's face it, the original Septuagint was only the first five books of Moses, and that's lost to history. And so uh, for them to cite, they use the Septuagint Septuagint in the in the, the fourth century AD. Odds are it was a revised uh, Septuagint. It had to be revised because they were using uh, uh, books that weren't in the original. I mean, when you exactly. get you know Psalms and Isaiah, the prophets and the writings, they were never written in the original Septuagint. Only the first five books of Moses. This is you know historicity of their canonization needs to be scrutinized by any God-fearing person uh, in order to come to true uh, saving knowledge of Almighty God. And that saving knowledge comes with legitimate repentance before Almighty God. And you need to see that the Christological glasses, the bias that comes with it, is is part of idolatry. Yes, bias. I mean, you know, uh, it wasn't just, you know, even the in the ancient days, when they were amalgamating with every phony religion uh, in the third, second, third, and fourth, and fifth centuries, um, they were swallowing up, them up by, by trying to, you know, interject or read their ideas into the Christian belief. And um, you know, some of the surviving uh, atrocities are like the Christmas tree, you know, right? Uh, it's Easter bunny, um, you know, silly things like this that you can track. Uh, when they were instituted, um, you know, but there's uh, a a person, if you just don't want to cop out of knowing uh, for belief alone, um, you can study, uh, you can grab the hem of a learned rabbi and they will respond to the right approach. You must approach them as holy men of God. And I'll tell you, they are open to people who are of uh, legitimate, honest, searching demeanor and uh, you'll be received with great kindness, love, and care, and shown the truth of uh, uh, Torah and Tanakh as it was intended, and your eyes will be enlightened without those Christological glasses that carry the bias and our idol worship. Uh, but right. even uh, when they were amalgamating idols, uh, religions that were idolatrous, they always you know, just did it with the Christological glasses. Well, this means this, and that means it was the Manichaean style of twisting and spiritualizing everything. And um, you can study uh, the Manichaeans, and you can see, you know, I think there's still records of the debate between uh, Augustine and uh, the Manichaean leader in the year 400. I think there's still recorded debates in in Rome of this from the year 400. Mm. Uh, But it's what enabled... uh, um, Augustine to become the Archbishop of Hippo, which was North Africa, the whole, you know, all the way to Egypt and uh, the, the, to the, to the uh, west coast of Africa and the north, uh, mm-hmm. Morocco. And, uh, you know, that was a close link to Spain and uh, all they sailed all throughout that Mediterranean region. It was an influential and it swept along that area because spiritualism was, you know, so, uh, so in sync with, um, with, uh, superstitious beliefs and sad yeah. to say, um, you know, it just makes sense to the, the, the superstitious, uh, everything gets all ooey gooey spiritual and, uh, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not measurable. It's all unfalsifiable and, uh, um, you can't, you can't weigh it in a bag. You can't uh, measure it on a scale. It's, it's idea. It's, it's, right. it's notion. It's, it's fantasy. And, <laughs> um, yeah. And sometimes fantasy seems, uh, you know, more real than reality. Just look at the kids that watch the, uh, the, uh, Marvel movies today. I mean, that, uh, Dr. Strange and, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the latest one in the, 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 what is it? The multiverse of madness. Oh, the multiverse. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, think about it. I mean, you're talking ideas that are so off, off, off the wall, things that it can't be proven, but you know, you spin together a yarn and put it together and right. spend hundreds, of uh, $150 million putting together some, you know, and they, they, they sell hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's right. really where a lot of the, 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 the phony religious pantheon of uh, gods were like, you know, superheroes. Now I read a lot of comic books as a kid and, uh, you know, I could see the theme work in the Marvel early comics, you know, it was, you know, very parallel to a lot. Right. Of, uh, I mean, you even see in Marvel comics, 
Hercules and um, Thor. Thor, you know, liter- literal polytheistic gods that are being rebranded as superheroes. Oh, it is. Yeah, rebranded as superheroes, yeah. And it's still the pursuit for power. You know, yeah. you got to look at the common themes, the pursuit for power. People like that, you know, superstitious people like the idea of having power, who, you know, right. and some kind of authority over others and uh, the evil eye. And, and I mean, the know. entire theme completely is dualistic. You have the good force versus the bad force. You know, that's, that's what Manichaean pushed in everything. Yeah, That's just good entertainment. That's what people go after, you know, is that good triumphs over evil. You well, know, so you, you know, the idolatrous, ancient idolatrous world was just rife with that sort of stuff. Right, exactly. Uh, the whole Greco, uh, Greek, uh, Greek pantheon, Roman pantheon, you know, was just, you know, uh, taking ideas and powers attributed and, you know, in the person personification form. And, you know, you can just see the merging and the melding of the whole ideas and right. uh, how they sold it, uh, you know, under the banner of Christianity. Uh, if you just begin to look at the process of canonization, you can get your tangible way out of uh, that abusive stuff. But, you know, I encourage you turn to a learned Jewish rabbi, uh, preferably Orthodox. And if you approach them with the utmost of uh, uh, respect, you'll find they will they will respond in kind and um don't go with the preconceived glasses and the biases and, and the eisegesis because you're 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 making statements more than mm-hmm. you are asking questions. Right. Uh, but you can uh, you can be set free from that that idolatry that that wears Christian glasses. Yeah. Well, all right, Dan. I think we just about covered the whole thing. What do you say? Well, I think I think you know. I mean, yeah. How how much more to psychology do you want to talk? I mean. That article I, uh, from Psychology Today, which just look it up, bias, what it is. If you can affect it, that in your life for the better and uh, uh, realize that, you know, bias is, is, you know, can you be unbiased? Generally not, you know, right. but you got to minimize it and minimize the heart harms and hurts it does. Don't leave a wake of disaster, but, uh, um, you know, Christianity is, is taking it so far to damn people, you know, if you do it or you're damned, you know, and that's just not true. It's not, it's not what uh, almighty God is abundant in mercy. Um, and I don't want to, you know, say anything that's out of order, but right. he is abundant in mercy and, uh, he desires that the repentant turn uh, or that people turn to him in repentance and, um, like I said before, any success that could be attributed in Christianity had to do with legitimate repentance before Almighty God. Somebody saying, yep. you know, I've been wrong here and, and, and Almighty God responding with that tad of kindness uh, or mercy. Uh, you know, that's just how Almighty God is, but not, you know, I, I mean, I still talk with a lot of people that have difficulty getting out of it and uh, they prayed so much to the man they, they that they mm-hmm. can't stop you know they, they, it just causes issues you got to take the christological glasses off right. discard them completely and uh just pray to the father and um, um he knows your heart he knows all your days before one of them ever began and yep. uh he's got a plan and a purpose for your life and uh, uh you can achieve your full potential and make this world a better place and um uh, I encourage everybody to take steps towards that, but you got to drop the eisegesis the, the, yep. the, for sure reading into the text rather than, uh, uh, taking out from it, what it really says. Uh, mm-hmm. but there's enough out there on, uh, like to knock talk and, uh, on the no height world center, you can find material that will tutor you out of, uh, uh, uh any ideas and, and, uh, communities are starting to develop thousands and thousands of people around the globe turning, uh, towards the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, that's the seven Noahide laws uh, that um, are clearly uh, laid out, um, though not textually stated. Even the word religion doesn't exist in, in right. the Bible. Right. Um, so, you know, you got to look at it for what it truly says. Let the rabbis teach you where they're drawn from uh, and see logically. I mean, you know, you got to ask yourself, like, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, 
By right. what standard would Almighty God have to judge them so harshly? If they did not know what they were doing was wrong, um, Almighty God would have no no right to impose right. Uh, the justice judgment. Of- yeah, and so, uh, you know, uh, there's Lord loads destroying of... destroying the world with a flood. They're called the Noahide laws, the children of Noah laws, basically what Noahide means. That's uh, right. Yeah, and everybody. And you, you do them. you do actually see a direct commandment from um, one of the seven, the sixth one, not to eat the limb of a living animal. You see that after the flood is over and Noah gets yeah, off. Don't the be ark. cruel. Don't be cruel uh, right. to animals. Right. Exactly. You know, in that regard, I mean, like I said before, uh, pre-refrigeration, um, it was common in marketplaces to sell a leg of lamb off of a live le- lamb and just hack it right off as you ordered and tie it off. And, and, you know, and you get all these screaming animals in marketplaces pre refrigeration. And, uh, you know, now we have the benefits of going to our supermarkets, get things in a freezer. Yep. Uh, they didn't have those privileges. And, uh, so things have to be put in their context and in their setting. Exactly. And, uh, and 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 brought up to speed, and the seven Noahide laws make perfect logical sense. But to to do such, because Almighty God has created these four men as an interface. The term mitzvot is more a connection. Uh, and um, when you're doing a mitzvot as a connection, because God said don't do it, He understands your heart, and there's relational interface the way He is intended, rather than just doing it logically because oh I don't kill anyways I don't uh, I don't have illicit sexual right, uh, right. relations and da, 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 you know that sounds okay we we you know simple enough but but there's depth there and they're truly veins of of gold that you can mine and they mm-hmm. branch into many many more of the 613 mitzvah that the Hebrew people have uh, some say the Noahide uh, code encompasses more than a hundred. Uh, but when you understand the depth and the logic and you, you develop that true circumcised heart uh, in your approach to walk in everyday life, it just makes all the difference rather than doing it because you think uh, somebody right. died died for you and uh, so you don't have to die. I mean, you know, who wouldn't who wouldn't want to take a uh, jump on a on a pleasure cruise, you know, that is sold as a no cost option, you know, you'd be silly right. not to jump on it and that's really why many people had turned to christianity over the last several thousand years but they didn't realize what they got themselves into and the bias yep. and the depth and the weaving together uh, uh, of their text and the development of ideas and the honing that happened uh, to make it uh, uh, plant people in their churches and uh, um, <coughs> oh, like we did with the tulip i mean um, mm-hmm. yeah i just i think yeah Eisegesis reads into things rather than draw out what is it intended. And uh, what Almighty God has truly passed down is the Torah and Tanakh, mm-hmm. not the New Testament. And you can just get that if you just look at the canonization process and um, the changes that went along with that canonization. And, you know, yeah, what remains historistic? You can't get away from this history. That's the history mm-hmm. of the Christian Church, and uh, right. you know, and then yeah, so it's atrocious and idolatrous. Right. As a, and I'll leave us off with a a little joke, as Rabbi Stuart Federer likes to say when we talk about I see Jesus, is I see Jesus. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they see. Yeah, that's, that's all, all they see. see. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. Yeah, you know, and, uh, you know, we're all praying for our families and their friends and associates and uh, our communities. And we're all trying to labor to try to make the world a better place and work towards uh, uh, development and growth. I mean, you, you know, just got to ask yourself, you know, how could so many scriptures uh, haven't been fulfilled? The Messianic scriptures not been fulfilled by uh, Jesus and uh, just imagine the second coming uh, claim uh, mm-hmm. it itself is eisegesis. They, they, oh they, yeah, you know, definitely. Yeah. They, many wouldn't taste death until, uh, until they, they saw him, you know, return. And, and after that passed, you know, all uh, as Rabbi Singer says, it was a wound that they, uh, they, the church would never recover from. Never to uh, recover from. 
Yeah, because, uh, you know, if anybody uh, could fulfill it all the second time, uh, right. it, it could and be anybody. Right, my sister-in-law could be the Messiah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you're going to rebuild the temple, but the temple was still standing. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, point being... Uh, it all falls apart. It all falls apart, yeah, right at that second coming question, and, uh, you know, yeah, see it for what it is. It's idolatry. And it's Romanized, uh, 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 Romanized, uh, uh, Greco-Roman idolatry, all mingled in with a man God, and yep. designed to keep you paying and staying, and uh, your family and your genealogy entrenched and entangled. When there is a legitimate, better way, uh, right. don't let believing be a cop out for knowing. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, often, if I'm ever in any arguments or debates with Christians, it's over. Well, that's what you believe, you know, and that's <laughs> how you interpret. And, um, you know, that's all they got to hinge their hats on because they've got nothing uh, that's falsifiable. So it's all got to remain on those those phony hinges of right. uh, belief and interpretation. Uh, but the, the Torah Tanakh is still here and it's crystal clear. And the Dead Sea Scrolls validate that they're as true today as they've ever been. And uh, the rabbis you can trust um, will be be honest and legitimate uh, as God-fearing uh, uh, men if you're, you approach them in the right fashion. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to the day where... Uh, uh, the knowledge of God covers the earth as the, the waters cover the seas. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, you got to, you know, stop the belief as a cop out and uh, right. for knowledge. Yeah, right. Don't, don't learn, learn, it. learn. Yeah. You can't go wrong. And you can make the world a better place and live a fulfilled life here and uh, uh, be assured a portion in the world to come. Um, yeah. yeah. It's beautiful. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, my friend. As always, I appreciate you taking the time to come on here with me. Well, thanks for having me again, Steve. And uh, maybe in a couple of weeks, we'll do another one. We'll see. Yeah, sounds great. All, and right. all right, everybody. Thanks for tuning That's in. Good. And we'll uh, we'll see you next time. Bye for now.